I'm sure you guys have heard about the current trend of psychedelic therapy for mental health issues such as PTSD, depression. You might see articles popping up about psychedelics, but what does it all mean? You've probably heard recently that Elon Musk uses the psychedelic drug ketamine and openly supports the drug's use in treating depression. Today, we have Jay Godfrey on the show. He's founder of Nushama Wellness, a treatment center in New York that uses ketamine therapy as groundbreaking treatment for many people who have become resistant to all other types of treatment like talk therapy and even some medications and are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I thoroughly enjoyed my hour-long conversation with Jay. I am not a drug user, and I'm a little bit scared of psychedelics in general, and he laid it all out for me of why this therapy is going to be the new and improved way for people to really get to the bottom of feeling better. So I am so excited to introduce Jay Godfrey, the CEO of New Shama, and I really hope that you guys take a moment to listen to what is misunderstood about psychedelics and its uses in mental health. Hi, Jay. Thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Of course. So I wanted to ask you, Nushama, that's an interesting name. What does it mean? So it's a take on the Hebrew word Neshama, which means soul. Okay. And it's a take on the words new shaman. And shamans were the original plant medicine healers and the original uh, healers who used psychedelic medicine to treat what they referred to as ailments of the spirit. What medicine today or psychiatry today would refer to as depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, eating disorders, Mm -hmm. et cetera. So psychedelics seem to be going through like a renaissance right now. I think for a long time, obviously, people um, didn't know what they were for beyond just having fun, right? And still to this day, I think a lot of people are scared to try anything. Why all of a sudden is this become something where wellness companies are popping up with psychedelics as the medicine to heal? It's a great question. So these are not new in a sense. They've been around 6,000 years, you know, Mazatec tribe in Mexico, um, Western Africa, uh, groups have used psychedelics to, again, treat ailments of the spirit. And then in the 50s and 60s, um, Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, who became Ramdas, started doing research at Harvard with psilocybin, which is the active ingredient mm-hmm. in magic mushrooms, mm-hmm. as well as uh, LSD. Uh, and they found some great things. They found some great evidence that these medicines, when used properly mm-hmm. with the right supervision, could be incredibly beneficial in the reduction of symptoms of depression and anxiety and addiction. But one problem happened in the 60s, which was Timothy Leary thought everybody should have these medicines, not just those under medical supervision. So, you know, the old tale of, you know, the Woodstockification of the 60s, free love, free LSD, um, it became an issue for the federal government and it became an issue for our society that you had all these people strung out on LSD. Um, and the war on drugs started at the beginning of the 1970s, which basically banned and scheduled all drugs of all sorts, uh, including those that when used properly under medical supervision could really help uh, people who are struggling. Fast forward to 2018. Mm-hmm. Why was 2018 different? Well. There was a guy by the name of Michael Pollan who wrote a book, How to Change Your Mind, which really talked about the new science behind psychedelic medicine, how it could help people with depression, anxiety, addiction, and even end of life. And um, that was really the major, major catalyst for why this third wave of psychedelic medicine is becoming um, a real thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are about one year away approximately from MDMA or what they call on the street as ecstasy Mm -hmm. being approved by the FDA for post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. And currently, um, we're fortunate to have one molecule in ketamine that is a legal anesthetic medication, but also used as a psychedelic in clinics like Nishama. Right. So, and it's also important to point out that 
all medicines, I would think, when not taken the right way or the prescribed way, can be very dangerous. Morphine happens to be one of the most essential medicines of our time. If you have a back surgery and you're going to want and need morphine in order to deal with the pain, uh, there's context for it. Uh, you would not want people on the street using morphine. Uh, you would not want people on the street using propofol, which is what right. You know, they anesthetize you to go to sleep in a mm -hmm. surgery. Michael Jackson used it inappropriately and he paid the price. Exactly. So uh, context, medical supervision, screening, they're all very, very important things. Okay. So talk about Nushama. How did you get involved in it first? So it's interesting. I'm, uh, I'm a former investment banker and a former fashion designer, which is kind of an unusual combination. Mm -hmm. In about 2015, I started going to talk therapy which something that nobody talked about in my family. Like you were punished with talk therapy. You didn't go to talk therapy and talk about it openly. But I went in any case and, and, and in typical kind of Upper East Side, New York, um, therapy was $300 every single week. Mm -hmm. And I never missed a week for three years. So there's 156 appointments of me talking. Mm -hmm. My therapist had happened to be quite good. I was just really good at putting on a bit of a charade and a show for her. Um, really never getting to the heart of the matter of what was giving me anxiety and why I was living in worry and why I was living in scarcity. And did she put you on any medication? Fortunately not, although that is a major um, issue that I'm sure we could probably get into. Mm -hmm. um, but she didn't put me on any medication. And at the end of the three years, I'd recognized I'd spent – about $50,000 on therapy. Mm -hmm. And I did have good coping mechanisms. Right. But there was still something underlying it all that was unsettled, that was unfinished, that was undiscovered. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine gifted me How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. And I actually didn't read it for a while because why am I going to read a book about drugs? Mm -hmm. I've never done any drugs. I'm college. I think I smoked pot three times. Mm -hmm. anyway, it was okay. It was fine. I have nothing against it, but it wasn't, I'm not the guy who was snorting lines of cocaine, uh, at Lotus in right. the nineties at in New York. It just wasn't my thing. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty straight arrow. And, um, after reading the book, I was absolutely convinced that this was the future of how people with mood disorders like depression and anxiety. And PTSD and addiction would be transcending these issues. Hmm. And um, I was very, very lucky to get introduced to plant medicine. Uh, shortly thereafter, in 2019, August 2019, I had my very, very first psychedelic journey. I was terrified going in. It was uh, psilocybin or the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Mm-hmm. And as I went through this first journey in August 2019, my whole world was completely shattered in the best possible way. There was no feelings of really being high or anything. It was really about an inward experience of examining the belief systems, the stories that I had grown up with. The assumptions that I made that were proven to be incorrect, the blame that I put on others and didn't take responsibility for. And so I came out of that first one almost a new person, but somebody who definitely had more patience, more compassion for myself, um, you know, more love for myself. Uh, and, and really it started me looking within on a monthly basis with psychedelic medicine to the point that in about June 2020, I was on my seventh or eighth experience. And let me just clarify for one second. When you say experience, you weren't just like doing this in your living room by yourself. No, this is done in nature with music playing, with a guide, mm -hmm. uh, with an eye mask, and you are on a mat and you are going within, not talking to anybody for Five or six hours. Okay. And I mean, you have no track, you have, you have no concept of time during. You could think it'd be 35 minutes and you think you're there for three weeks. Right. You just don't know. Right, right. But uh, in June 2020, 
It's right in the thick of COVID. Yeah. And I'm a former women's wear dress designer. Mm. And there were no events. Yeah. So nobody was buying sequin cocktail dresses <laughs> or gowns or going to weddings or bar mitzvahs or whatever. And somehow, seven or eight journeys in, you'd think that I would be devastated because my business was going right into the ground. And at that moment, I really felt, you know, some people when they have, when they're on a, under the influence of a psychedelic medicine in a journey, feel like they've met God or they feel the presence of something else. I don't know what I felt the presence of that day, but I knew that I was chosen to do this hmm. in a way that I thought it was profoundly unfair that in the middle of COVID, while everybody else was double and triple and quadruple maxing, uh, masking rather, and everybody was terrified. And I should have been terrified because my livelihood was, was somewhat being blown to smithereens. Mm -hmm. I was okay hmm. in an unexplainable way. And so I resolved on that day to bring these medicines above ground and find a way to do, to blend the science of psychedelic medicine with some of the shamanic rituals that occur in the rainforests of Costa Rica or, or Peru, um, as well as doing it in an environment that is profoundly um, nurturing mm -hmm. and designed not as a doctor's office, but as a place where people can go to heal from within. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the medicine itself. Medicine is a tool to open you up so you can see. And once you see, you cannot unsee. So when did you open Nishama? So we opened Nishama in 2021, um, kind of tail end of the um, of COVID in late 2021, got us a few false starts. So we really started seeing patients in January 2022. So it's been about a year and a half. And where is it located exactly? It's at Madison Avenue and 53rd Street oh, wow. in New York. And um, in retrospect, I think we were a little ballsy. Mm. Um, we not only opened a psychedelic clinic right in the middle of New York City, but we opened a really big one. Oh, wow. And um, so it's it's the largest clinic of its kind in the world. Uh, it's 7,500 square feet. And if you would have told me kind of at the beginning, you know, am I going to fill this space up? Uh, I probably would have said, no, I'm happy to report a year later, a year and a half later, I should say. That many people are seeking redemption and renewal and rebirth, which is a story I know you know a lot about mm -hmm. um, through these medicines uh, with us. So at what point do you think people are finally coming through your office, like that they've decided, I want to try this journey? Um, because I know there's a lot of fear for people. Like you even said the first time you tried it, I mean, maybe there are people that come in that are have experienced drugs before psychedelics, but maybe there's a lot of people that haven't. So what is the point when people that you're seeing that people finally come into you most people who come to us at the moment are what they call treatment resistant these are people mm. who've tried more than two antidepressants or benzodiazepines like xanax mm -hmm. um and failed yeah and they don't come to us because they say oh, i want to go on a psychedelic journey in the middle of new york city and do it legally they really are sick and tired of being sick and tired yeah and they'll try anything and um some of the stories that you see are just stunning. Mm. And as MDMA becomes legalized next year and psilocybin a few years down the road and potentially, you know, versions of LSD and Ibogaine and DMT, um, people are reading about this more and they're discussing their experiences more. And the 50 years of stigma since the drug war started in 19, the early 1970s and the billions, if not trillions of dollars of government money that have been spent to convince us that these are dangerous and you'll they'll fry your freaking brains yeah. and just say no, um, that's starting to, to melt because people are seeing the results from the proper therapeutic use of, of these medicines. So what exactly do you guys use there? Is it ketamine-assisted therapy? It's ketamine-assisted therapy. Um, that's the only thing that's legal right now. Oh, okay. Um, but we deliver ketamine via an IV. Mm -hmm. So one of the benefits of that is um, if you're having a bad trip, because that's what people are worried about, yeah. you can stop it. 
So it's the only delivery mechanism where you can actually stop a psychedelic trip. You just turn the IV off Uh and you're out of it in five or six minutes. So let's break down for people that are listening. What is ketamine? Ketamine is an anesthetic that was legalized or or approved by the FDA in about 1970 as an anesthetic. Okay. Uh, The naysayers out there say it's a horse tranquilizer and that's BS. I mean, it's true. They do use it to tranquilize horses. But the most important thing that ketamine is used for is pediatric surgeries Mm. where they anesthetize children under the age of 12 Mm -hmm. with ketamine. Adults get propofol, children get ketamine. So it's been used for 50 years as a uh, children's anesthetic Mm -hmm. at much, much higher doses than psychedelic doses. It's also used as an analgesic, which is just a pain reliever. Mm. So people who've got really chronic um, pain conditions like fibromyalgia or migraines or CRPS, they'll use much higher doses of ketamine to uh, manage chronic pain conditions. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until in Russia in like the early 80s where one researcher found out that people were getting anesthetized with this to go into surgeries who had depression and they were coming out with far, uh, where their symptoms of the depression either had disappeared Mm -hmm. or had been dramatically reduced. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we have a a protocol of six sessions where if you come in with depression, you'll meet with a therapist before every single journey or treatment. Mm -hmm. You'll go into your treatment. You get attached to the IV. You're in your psychedelic experience in about 90 seconds and Mm. you stay there for about an hour. And the therapist meets with you after to determine all right, you had this psychedelic experience. Uh, physiologically, it's creating all these new neural connections in your brain, mm-hmm. which has been proven by fMRIs um, that either have never connected before or haven't connected since you were a child. Okay, I have so many questions. <laughs> hold, so hold on. You, uh, one thing you said, you were talking about um, pediatric care. We talked about briefly um, Netflix, one of their biggest shows right now is um, Take Care of Maya, which was about a 10-year-old at the time who was feeling all sorts of pain and was finally diagnosed after seeing five doctors with some disease that I'm forgetting the names of it now, but uh, wh- whatever it was. And they prescribed a ketamine-induced coma yeah. for 10 days or something. And after that, doses of ketamine to keep her pain at bay. And it seemed to work for her. And then after a year, she sort of relapsed. The father brought into jo- her into Johns Hopkins. And when the mother said, well, she needs her ketamine dose, they ended up thinking this was Munchausen's by proxy. They thought that she was abusing her child, ended up taking her uh, or giving the child to the state for three months while the courts got involved. And the mother ended up killing herself from being taken away from the daughter, all because of this situation with being prescribed ketamine, which she, the mother really believed in and thought it helped her daughter and the hospital thought it was abuse. So what are your thoughts on that kind of thing or that kind of treatment? I think after a couple of years of COVID and all listening to all the experts, we have to, we have to question every time we hear somebody who's an expert. I Mm. think that's one thing that I would say. The second thing I would say is any new idea is going to face resistance. And if it doesn't, it's not a good idea. Yeah, that's a good point. So ketamine fundamentally, when used properly, is a safe medication. Mm -hmm. It is, in fact, one of the World Health Organization's top 10 essential medicines on the face of the earth because of its use in pediatric populations. Hmm. So uh, it sounds like, and I haven't watched this show, Mm -hmm. um, the mother was in an enormous amount of despair because she found a solution for her daughter that the system took away from her. Right. And it's really that... Because they didn't believe in it because it was a totally different type of drug. And it's a threat to their their whole existence. And that's, that's why... Um, you know, the drug war started in in the beginning. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't want people to possibly think for themselves. Right. We wouldn't want people to be 
you know, don't forget it was a time when the draft was still a big thing and they were going to war in Vietnam. And what if people didn't want to go to war and they wanted to, you know, have free love? That's a threat mm -hmm. to the basic structure of our democracy. Right. Um, so the system has always been against psychedelic medicine. Uh, but now the, the genie's out of the bottle. Johns Hopkins is actually doing research on psychedelics, specifically psilocybin. Imperial mm -hmm. College of London, NYU, uh, UCLA, University of Exeter, and the list goes on and on mm -hmm. and on. And if you're an academic institution and a serious one, and you're not doing research right now on how these medicines in some way, shape, or form can help mood disorders, then you're not a serious uh, academic institution. Right. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices, and the path forward isn't always clear. I personally have been through a lot of trying times in my life, trauma, grief, for example. I think those are universal themes that people can really understand. I lost my fiance, Andy, in 9-11, and the pain was unbearable. Since then, I've gone through other traumas that didn't feel as big, but I still needed to talk to somebody. And having somebody I didn't know that well, but was really good at listening, felt like the right thing to do. And it was so helpful to me. I love that I can have someone to talk to that isn't one of my close friends that I can just confide in and feel like it's between us. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. I signed up for this just the other day. I've already been matched to the most perfect therapist for me, so I will let you guys know how that goes, but I'm super excited to try this service. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash understood today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash understood. Give online therapy a try at betterhelp.com slash understood and get on your way to being your best self. Guys, I'm so excited to tell you about our sponsor, Green Chef. Green Chef is the number one meal kit for eating well with dinners you can personalize to your own taste and lifestyle. I try to be very conscious of what I eat and I love that everything in Green Chef is pre-proportioned for me without having to measure. And as the only keto meal kit, which is super exciting, Green Chef makes sticking to a carb conscious lifestyle so easy. I take my health very seriously and I love it. The Green Chef does as well by bringing me seasonal recipes featuring certified organic fruits and vegetables, organic cage free eggs and sustainably sourced seafood. It's summertime, you guys, which means if you're like me, you're busier than ever with activities, kids at home, holidays. And what I love about Green Chef is that everything is done for you. All you have to do is throw it together and it's ready in literally less than 30 minutes. It's so fast. It's really going to save you time this summer. And even when you go back to school with the kids, these are great options to make spending time with them easier. So you're spending less time in the kitchen. Now, let me tell you about the meal that I most recently made. It was so amazing. I took it out of the box. It has a card that teaches you exactly how to cook. I am not a chef. And I swear to you that within 30 minutes, I was eating a meal that tasted like I got it out of a restaurant. Sage brown butter chicken piccata is my new favorite thing. And you guys should order it because it's phenomenal. And I have a couple other meals. I'm making one for dinner tonight. I'm going to make one for dinner tomorrow. And I can't wait for my next box from Green Chef to arrive. So you guys, I'm telling you, you have to give Green Chef a try today. Use our special discount code for a great deal. It's 50% off. Go to greenchef.com slash understood 50 and use code understood 50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. That's greenchef.com slash understood 50 to get 50% off plus free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. What is the difference between a ketamine infused therapy and like somebody doing ayahuasca? Yeah. Get that question all the time. I'll start with a similarity with all psychedelics and then go in specific sure. difference uh, to address your question. So the point of a psychedelic journey is not to get effed up. It's not to see rainbows and butterflies, although that can happen. Mm -hmm. It's about dimming the switch 
on an area of your brain called the default mode network. It's the area that houses the ego, our opinions, our judgments, our search for validation, our anger. It dims that switch while you're under the influence. And why, why is dimming the switch important? Is because that's what keeps us in our thinking brain. Mm -hmm. When we get out of our thinking brain and into our hearts, we get to see things as they are. Yeah. So a lot of people come out of these psychedelic experiences that, you know, my whole life I've been thinking that my mother or father or brother did this to me. And what I recognized is I actually embellished and made up a story that just wasn't true. Mm. And um, so dimming the ego is really, really helpful for the therapeutic process. And so you asked how ayahuasca compares. Well, ayahuasca also will dim your ego. Um, as will ketamine and LSD and Ibogaine and all the other ones that aren't currently legal. Um, ayahuasca happens to be a brew, uh, a concoction of sorts uh -huh. that is typically used in Peru or, or um, Costa Rica or, and other countries. And uh, it contains DMT. DMT is a psychedelic that, um, again, it's very, very strong. They refer to it as the God particle or the God molecule. And many people have intense visuals with ayahuasca but also experience the present of a godlike uh, existence. Mm -hmm. Some people uh, feel that they are God during the experience mm -hmm. or that they're speaking to some sort of divine power. Ketamine um, is legal, or ayahuasca is illegal, uh, and is also a much shorter experience. Ketamine is a one-hour journey. Right. Um, you can have a very, very intense visuals, um, but... One of the main, main differences in clinical practice is that ketamine's had kind of 50 year safety record being used in a variety of different methods. Uh, the, the ayahuasca supporters will say, well, ayahuasca's had 6,000 years in the jungle. And that is true. Mm -hmm. It just hasn't been done under the auspices of, of the FDA or, or the medical authorities in the United States, but it's being researched and it's very, very exciting that it's being researched. One of the things I know about ayahuasca is that a lot of people's fears going into it is the purging aspect. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people believe that's part of it and it's good to purge. Um, that's not something that happens in the ketamine treatment, is it? So ayahuasca, it's common to purge, throw up or mm -hmm. something else. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, as devastating. Yeah, yeah just even as more. Um, so. <laughs> I will tell you from my own experience. Whatever fears that go into them, once your ego is dissolved, fear is ego in manifestation. So mm -hmm. once your ego is gone, you're not worried about throwing up. It is part of it. Mm -hmm. Can it happen with ketamine? It does, but very, very, very infrequently. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of doing it in a clinical environment is you can give somebody, you know, Zofran, which is something right. that reduces nausea. So it, it almost never happens with ketamine. Um, but even if it does, the people who are egoless are like, oh, well, I just threw up. Right, right. Okay, so I know p most people will want to know, like, the dirty details of if I was walking into your clinic, what do, like, how do I make sure I'm in the right frame of mind? I think it's, it, do you organize the set, as that was called, sort of, so you're in the mindset, you're also making sure that everything around you is good. Like, tell me the whole thing of how to prepare. So. Prior to even coming in, everybody gets a medical intake. Okay. That's to make sure it's safe for you. Um, not every person is a good candidate. Somewhere between 80 and 90% of the people get approved for treatment. Who doesn't? People with out of control blood pressure, people with uh, mm. schizophrenia or a family history of certain types of bipolar. Those are kind of, uh, unfortunately, those screen you out. Okay. But assuming you get pass. approved for treatment and pass, you come in. You, you know, clinic and is, is that over the phone or is that in person also? Either. Okay. The, the, the initial medical intake can be done either virtually or in person. Okay. Then, um, people come into our clinic at Madison and 53rd and it doesn't look anything like a doctor's office. I okay. Mean, there's, you know, silk flowers hanging from the ceilings and Jessica Lichtenstein's murals all over the place. Yeah. Um, and it's really quite a lovely environment, um, to be in. You know, people say they don't want to leave, but they'll get escorted to a private room that's no, you know, no smaller than this. And there's mm -hmm. a zero gravity chair and blankets and, you know, inspirational books. And that person or journeyer, as we like to call them, 
Uh, we'll get all their vitals taken just to be sure that, you know, there's been no spike in blood pressure. People get nervous. It's natural. And then the therapist comes in and they sit down with you and they'll say, Rachel, well, tell me about what's going on with you right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say, well, I'm very, very nervous. I've never done this before. Or last time I did it recreationally, it didn't go well, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Or I'm just feeling very anxious because I'm, my mother's bothering me, my father, whatever it is. Yeah. And the idea would be to um, establish a proper mindset okay. going in, which is what Timothy Leary talked about is the two most important things about a psychedelic journey are the set and the setting. Okay. So the mindset refers to the set. Mm -hmm. This is about planting some seeds within you mm -hmm. so that when your ego is dissolved, maybe they'll blossom or show up for you. Right. Um, you know, one example of a seed planting that, that I like going into my journeys. And it's, it can be very simple. Today is not the day to find all the things that are wrong with you. Go in and find all the things that are right with you. Mm. Go look within and, and see yourself the way people who love you see you. And so those, those are the types of seed planting we'll do. We'll do some breath work with them to relax their body. The IV will be placed. We'll turn the ketamine on. You'll put noise canceling headphones on the most beautiful soundtracks that really are intended to guide you through the treatment. And you'll put on an eye mask. Mm -hmm. You'll recline the chair to zero gravity mm -hmm. position and then you're off into the cosmos. And that lasts for about an hour. And some people experience the most intense visuals. Um, some people don't have any visuals and just experience an overwhelming amount of love for themselves and others. People come out uh, of their experiences sometimes with a sense of forgiveness for people they felt like they've wronged. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's quite lovely. And, and people do this six times over three weeks as part of our protocol. And, okay, and so how do they come off it? Is it like a drip that sort of starts to slow down? And After the hour, mm -hmm. the drip ends. And then it takes somewhere between 10 and 20 minutes to come back to this consciousness. Got it. And when you come back, a lot of people... We'll say, what was that? <laughs> or, You'll never believe what I just saw or experienced. Right. Or I can't believe I've thought my entire life that I assumed this and the opposite is true. And, and okay. And then, then the therapist will sit with you and discuss it. And it's called integration. And integration is the most important part of a psychedelic experience because it's really about taking the learnings from that experience and incorporating it or integrating it in your daily life. Mm. So it's not enough that you saw that you were not nice to your brother or sister when you were a child and you feel guilty and you're carrying that guilt. It's, okay, now that you know, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. um, do a lot of people go in it hoping to see someone from their past and connect with them or whatever that is for them? Do you see people in this kind of journey? We... uh we had a lady in recently who uh, I think is in her late 50s. And it, when she was in her 40s, she lost an eight-year-old child to cancer. Oh. Just horrible trauma. Terrible. And um, she was hoping to see her son and didn't for the first either four or five experiences. And then finally, um, she felt his presence. Mm. And when she integrated, and this always gets me, so I'm, if I get a little misty. No, it's making um, me, it's like touching me. You yeah. Know, I, I feel it. She said that, if, if, I, if I recall exactly the story, she said that her eight-year-old son came to her as a grown-up in her journey. Mm -hmm. Basically said, Mom, it's time to move on. Oh, that's so special. So, and that must have been so nice for her. Oh, it was. Or freeing. You know, I, I I can't speak to the pain that's involved in losing a child. Mm -hmm. But to let go of it, just... Yeah. Okay. I, I know. That's a lot. <laughs> We're both tearing up here. Um, I've read that music has a lot of an effect on psychedelic therapy. Is that true? It is true. Um you do not want to bring your own playlist of Big Floyd or <laughs> right. Led Zeppelin. Or, or Hollow Notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, any of those. Um, really, the playlists that we have are intended to guide you through the experience. Mm -hmm. And people without um, psychedelic experience say, well, what does that mean? 
effectively, you're going in anxious. Mm -hmm. You're going in with doubts and you're going in with your ego self. And I think us. that's important to point out that everyone's nervous. I am still nervous <laughs> to this day. You are. Um, but the music itself guides you in in such a way that is inspirational at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It encourages you to surrender to the experience, which is a good microcosm for life to let it go and surrender. Yeah. But to really surrender, to know that you're safe, to know that what you see, good or bad, is you. Mm. So if you see something you don't like, you know this is where you sit most of the time. Right. And you'll know you'll be resolved to change things. Or if you see something that you don't normally see, which is uh, a being uh, filled with love and compassion and generosity, but you don't behave like that in your life, again, you can resolve to change that. And then the music gets very chill mm -hmm. for most of the hour. And then as the as the drip ends... As the journey ends, it's really about taking you out of it and, and, and lifting you up and elevating you because that is the purpose of this work. Mm -hmm. It's not about getting high and it's not about, you know, escapism, actually. It's quite the opposite. It's about going within and it's about um, really touching the part of you that you've built walls around. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is that, you know, I've been on antidepressants before and, you know, they don't really get to the heart of why you feel that way. They cover up those feelings so you don't have to feel them. They kind of help in that way. But you can stay on those drugs for a really long time because it's not addressing why you feel that way. And talk therapy might not be enough to get to that mm. root. And it sounds like in these kind of treatments, you get to the root much quicker. And it's almost like you're not overthinking it. It's just coming to you or you're able to immerse yourself in the experience to let your mind open up because so many of us are trapped in our own thoughts, right? So That's very astute. I like to say that successful psychedelic experiences are about playing the witness mm. or becoming your own observer. And so you just get to see, you know, I had, I had uh, a few experiences in my childhood that weren't capital T trauma, but they were lowercase t trauma. And I, I revisited them. I was re-exposed in a way during my journeys. And I wasn't upset by what I saw. It was, oh, that happened. Okay. I get it. And you know, I was upset at the time and I built walls around me and defense mechanisms that, that, that served me well when I was eight or nine mm -hmm. to prevent it from happening again. But I'm in my forties now, like enough already. Yeah. And it really becomes you take a sense of ownership and a sense of responsibility. And one great thing that this work really does, because it is work, mm -hmm. that it does really shift you out of blame and into responsibility. Right. You just said something that made me think of the fact that I've actually talked to a lot more people about ayahuasca, let's mm -hmm. say, and some of them will say, well, I don't need that. There's nothing wrong with my life. I like who I am. I don't need something like that to help me, or I, I don't know what would come out of that. A lot of those people too. <laughs> yeah. It would be a waste of my time. But so you don't need to be coming into Nushama just because you're at your wit's end and you need to figure out your life. I mean, it could be for the everyday average person and still get something out of it, right? So right now, just because of the regulations, we do have people with diagnoses. But mm. in New York City, generalized anxiety is a huge percentage of the population. Depression so do you have to get a, a prescription from someone to come so in, so our, to speak? Our, our, our medical professionals, our doctors, um, if you come with a diagnosis, they'll reconfirm it or they have the ability to diagnose you as well. Mm. Um, you know, we don't really want people coming at this point in time for for fun. But what yeah. I will say is that I'm a believer that in five or ten years' time, once the once a few more psychedelic molecules are legalized and there's more of these types of discussions that bring awareness to people who are suffering, mm -hmm. I don't think we have to wait till somebody's treat treatment resistant or wait till they've got anxiety or an addiction. Or wait till they've got PTSD. Right. That is cruel. Yeah. To, and, and that's what the system does now. And so I'm hoping that people can use these journeys as preventative medicine mm. so that they don't have to be struggling. It's right. unnecessary. Um, how do you know that it's working? How do, how do people get like a tangible effect or moment? Could it be after that first treatment? It can be. It's not normally. Uh, after the first, it does take, there's kind of a compounding effect. Okay. Uh, at least with ketamine. 
I know there's lots of stories in the research trials about um, psilocybin or one or two or three doses of it can really take your depression from from serious to to minor or major to minor. Um, people can get mystical and beautiful experiences after one, but really it's about continuing to do the work. Um, it does take time. Mm -hmm. And you said people come in for six treatments. How do they split them up? Is it generally monthly? they're over three weeks? That's oh. two a week. Um, oh, that's you quick. know. And okay. then what typically happens is is the research, not only the the clinical research, but our internal research has shown that after about three or four months, if somebody's got depression and they came in with major depression, the depression, if it's not completely gone, it'll go from kind of ma major scores. There's scoring questionnaires like the GAD7 and the PHQ9 where they'll they'll fill out these questionnaires and their their depression will go from major to minor and then generally after a few months you start to actually see a little bit of an uptick mm. oh i feel myself getting a little bit more triggered or i feel myself um uh getting agitated a little more and we offer kind of what's called a booster program mm. or a refresher where they'll just come in for one treatment or two treatments you know, over time. And I think long term, um, these types of things where people are going to come in with diagnoses, I call them below the line, they're going to get to the baseline where they're going to be okay. And then maybe once a year, twice a year, they're going to come in to work on specific things mm -hmm. like revenge or work on jealousy or things that people become aware of after they do these experiences. Um, what could go wrong besides the bad yeah. trip? I mean, yeah. I know that's kind of like the obvious one. Or yeah. or actually, tell me about what a bad trip is, actually. So a bad trip, uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one for me. Okay. Um, a bad trip, I was scared. Visually, I saw things that made me very frightened. Um, and I resisted the medicine, and I started to... I wanted to get out of it. I, you know, you got to get this out of me. Stop, stop it. Can you speak during this? Are you ketamine? It's a little more difficult to speak. Some of the the uh, plant medicines, yeah, you can speak and move and talk. Uh -huh. uh, it's not recommended, but yeah. Um, and I was very angry. Mm. And just a lot of anger came up, and I didn't like it. And as I was integrating it, I recognized, and I was with a professional who really knew their stuff. He said, Jay, I'm not expecting you in this anger right now to understand. But your anger is coming up to show you this is where you live. Hmm. You live in this anger. You just don't see it because you've got blinders on. So just let that sit and, and sit with it for a couple of weeks. And I recognized that in order to let go of my anger, and I had anger issues. Mm -hmm order to let go of it, I had to re-experience them and see them for myself. Hmm. And when I saw them for myself, I was not proud. I, I, I looked at it like, that's not me. Yeah. And we're not born that way. We're not born jealous or pissed off or competitive or sarcastic or any of these things. Mm -hmm. You look at a baby, they're wondrous, wondrous. They're, they're uh, all about discovery. So we have to return to that consciousness. Right. So besides a bad trip, are there oh, besides, any other things? So what could go wrong? Yeah. Well, if someone's improperly screened, so we screen out again for um, uncontrolled hypertension or high blood pressure. So if somebody is not properly screened and they uh, have a psychedelic experience, whether legally with ketamine or illegally with a, the, the list of other psychedelics, there's risks of elevated blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Elevated blood pressure at a breaking point could cause a stroke. Mm -hmm. So if you – let me just say this for your audience. If you've got high blood pressure, don't consider doing a psychedelic experience without getting yourself screened by a doctor. Mm -hmm. That That's a must. And also don't lie on your screening test or whatever and <laughs> about not anything. Not unless you want a stroke. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, uh, the, what else could go wrong? With ketamine, you can be on an antidepressant while you do your journey. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the other psychedelics, you cannot. So – um, there are reports of people being on these psychotropic medications. At best, it's not working. But uh, on the flip side, some kind of negative outcomes, just really, really tough experiences. And, um, you know, outside of a medical context, all sorts of stuff can go wrong. You know, if 
Uh, I've been hearing stories of people who go to these nightclubs or dance clubs buying whatever they're buying and it's laced with something else. Mm -hmm. So that, that obviously can go wrong and, and that's kind of out of the range of what we do since ours is medically supervised. Mm -hmm. But, um, these are very powerful medicines. Um, they need to be treated with reverence. Mm -hmm. They need to be administered safely to the right people and they're not for everybody. Um, but if you if you take the proper precautions, you know you can you can really do well and, and transcend your your mood disorders with them. Is ketamine addictive? It's a great question as well. So ketamine under medical supervision at these doses has never been shown to to be mm -hmm. addictive. Um, you know our our chief medical officer talks about the idea of physical addiction and emotional addiction. Mm -hmm. Physical addiction is like you know heroin. You need your heroin okay. or whatever yeah. it is. Ketamine has not been shown to do that at all. There's no proof that ketamine is, is uh, physically addictive. Some people say that in taken in the wrong context, like people snort ketamine at nightclubs, um, they could be attached to the emotional uh, part. But we, again, mm. we've not seen it been addictive. In fact, the opposite could be true is we use ketamine in a medical context to counteract addictions like alcohol use disorder and opiate use disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, you've done a great job explaining all of this, um, but in general, what would you say is one of the most misunderstood things about either ketamine or psychedelics um, or its use in treatment and in depression? You know, yeah. what would you say is most misunderstood about it? Well, when I talk about it with friends of mine who haven't tried it, will I ever be the same? Yeah, I was going to say, question. are they nervous about who they're going to become? When they come out, even if they might not like themselves going in, they're just, they're like, but I'm okay with this. I just don't know on the other side what that will be. Well, I have a lot That's of, my fear. I have a lot of finance bro friends and uh -huh. they're worried about losing their, their edge, their edge. And the world wants them to lose their edge. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but th they'll say, you know, will I ever be the same? Am I just going to become this, you know, airy fairy mm. hippie? And the truth is that you become more of who you are. So I've always been a, you know, a very kind of type A person. I, I am ambitious. Uh, I just don't get caught up as much in the storytelling of why I need this watch or that car or to need to be seen at this party mm -hmm. the way I used to. Mm -hmm. Um, and it does not take away from my ability to work extremely hard and it does not take away from my ability. Uh, in fact, it enhances my ability because I've got a greater level of awareness. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, uh, distracted yeah. by thinking about, Ooh, what's that person going to think or how is this person going to judge me? Right. Right. Um, what about people that are not drug users? Like I don't use drugs. Our friend Adam does not use drugs, Yeah, that's right. but because he's your neither, partner. Neither do I. Yeah. Okay. So, but because he's your partner, it would be very interesting to have him experience what he's supporting. I would love yeah. him to do it. Oh, I want to do it. He's, he's tried it. Oh, he has yeah, tried he it. He has tried it because oh. he said, you know, and we're talking about Adam Weitzman, yeah. who's, who's a friend of both of ours. And he said, look, like, you know, I feel like I need to try it in order to talk about it. Mm. Good. You know, because he's a high profile guy and he knows a lot of people. And, I remember after his experience, he's like, wow, that was really cool. <laughs> and it, he, he, he's taught, he's spoken about it on the record. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that did an article on, on investing in the psychedelic movement. And he talked about how it, it opened him up and really, um, made him more aware of certain of his own behaviors and own patterns mm. that we all have. Yeah. Um, Adam's a lovely guy to begin with. And, and, um, I think this, this only helped him kind of become more of who he is. I love that for him. Okay. Um, also, I'm just curious, what does something like this cost the person yeah. walking in? So ketamine at Nusham is about $4,800 for six treatments. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have a lot of access programs where, you know, veterans and frontline workers get a third or about 35% off. We have scholarships for people in need, so we do four of those every month where people get a full scholarship wow. if they can't afford it. And the letters that we get um, about this scholarship program are just extraordinary. The trauma that people have experienced out there 
and have managed to transcend. I won't tell you about them again because I'll probably cry again, <laughs> but there, it, it's just extraordinary. We do group therapy. So people will go into a group and they'll do eight people in a room. Oh, wow. And they, they do their preparation and their journey and their integration together, okay. which is, uh, which is amazing. And then we have these financing programs where you can spread your payments out over 12 or 24 months. So we do our best to, to, to make it accessible. You brought up something about vets and it's yeah. funny. I was mentioning that I was going to be interviewing you to someone the other night and I didn't even know that they were a veteran. And they said, you know, I've done that. I've done ketamine therapy at the vet clinic, okay. basically. Yeah. And um, he said that was the only way that I got through my PTSD. And it's been really hard for me returning back into normal life. And he said that that has been something so huge for him personally. And he's not a drug user. He's, you know, yeah. at all. He's, you know, doesn't believe in it. And um, he said that that was very, very helpful to people that had come back from war. And um, he was hoping that that would become more of something that was given to these men and women coming back um, into America to help them get through the process. The Veterans Administration issues every single year $17 billion of checks to veterans as disability payments for PTSD alone. Mm. $17 billion a year. That's obviously also excluding the people who've been had horrible traumas that don't involve being a vet. So PTSD is a very, very major issue mm. in the here and now. And ketamine and other psychedelics like MDMA are enormously helpful. Um, part of the reason that these medicines are helpful is PTSD is a very, very interesting uh, diagnosis underneath the umbrella of mood disorders. Because people often um, re-experience most of their trauma every single day and they go right up to the edge of the cliff and don't fully experience it. So it keeps them in this loop of fear and trauma. What the psychedelic therapy allows them to do, it dims their ego and it allows them to go over the cliff mm -hmm. without the fear. Yeah. And so they see it for what it is and why... PTSD is so, I don't want to say easily broken, but broken with psychedelic medicine is because it's a form of a re-exposure therapy, but without the judgments, without the opinions. You hear stories like, oh, yeah, that was tough. That really did hurt. That really was scary. But I'm okay now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so for people that have been listening, if they really are interested in starting their journey, yeah. um, what would you suggest, not only for them to reach out to you guys, but for them personally to get themselves prepared? And to try I think it's a great, you know, before I did my first journey, I did a lot of research and there's a lot, wealth of information. How to Change Your Mind is an amazing book. If, if your, your listeners haven't read it, okay. it's really a great history of the three um, waves of, of the psychedelic renaissance, the 6,000 years ago, the 50s and 60s, and then the here and the here and now. And it talks about why there's nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's used, if they are used properly. And, uh, so I think that's a good starting point. And before doing any experience or any medically supervised psychedelic journey, it's important to have intentions. Hmm. The intention could very well be, I just want to be open-minded and surrender and see what I learn. But it could also be, you know what? I'm, I got to tell myself the truth. Mm -hmm. Most people who come to us say they don't, they're not enjoying their lives. And the purpose of coming here, not to get all biblical, is joy. Yeah. We're supposed to experience love and joy and live from a place of compassion and generosity. And most people aren't living that way. Right. So if the, people can come into before their sessions with the intention to find that within them because we all have it within them, then that's a very, very good start. And where can people reach out to your clinic, find you guys, get approved if they are? Yep. We're at nushama.com. Mm -hmm. um, our Instagram is nushama wellness or at nushama wellness. Um, Spell it just so N-U-S-H-A-M-A mm -hmm. wellness, W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S. -S. And, um, there's a wealth of information on our website about a lot, some of the things that you ask, how it compares to other psychedelics, what to do to properly prepare, okay. what integration means, the do's and don'ts of before and after. Um, 
Great. And um, are you, do you listen to, or do you read your DMs if people have questions for you now that they've heard you? You can absolutely DM us. Um, okay. We, we get back to people as soon as we can, but it's generally within 24 hours. Okay. Um, it's always a great thing. And, and look, you can always on our website, people you can re- click request a consultation and a live human being will call you within 24, 48 hours and walk you through the program. Mm-hmm. Um, in a much more detailed way than I did free of charge. And out of curiosity, are you personally there? Are you leading yeah. anyone through these journeys? So I'm, I'm at the clinic, uh, most days. Um, no, I, I leave it to the professionals <laughs> to guide people through these journeys. Mm-hmm. These are all people who are, are therapists that are licensed therapists okay. or they've had uh, a lot of training, um, with psychedelic medicine in one way, shape or form. Um, I have, I happen to be a person who's been deeply moved. My family's been deeply moved by working with these medicines. Um, and I've experienced a, a sense of rebirth to the point where I wanted to uh, create a career out of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm not qualified <laughs> to sit with somebody yeah. and uh, and talk about their trauma. Out of curiosity, has your family come in and tried it? Yes, there are members. My <laughs> wife has, has tried it uh, a number of times. And she uh, has had some of the most profound experiences. She's her mental health was pretty good to start with, mm-hmm. um, but she's really uh, seen deeply into some of the things that maybe hold her back, and some of the patterns and and belief systems that uh, are in need of disintermediating. Right. Well, I hope I see you again, hopefully at Nushama, because I want to be trying this. Um, Maybe I'll bring Adam with me. We'll do it in a group therapy setting. Um, But it's been a pleasure and an honor to meet you. And I'm really excited about what you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.